The gentleman being interviewed is Mr. Neil Gummo, born January 7th, 1926. He currently lives at 2 Reynolds Drive in Horseheads, New York. My name, the interviewer, is Jason Harmon. I'm the collections manager here at the Historical Society. And Mr. Gummo, if you just want to kind of get us rolling here with the uh, particular ward that you served in, the branch, uh, your rank and location of service, and we'll just kind of take it from there. So. Okay. Well, I uh, was in the Army, uh, and eventually, when I went overseas, was with the 89th Infantry Division, and went over as a PFC, and I uh, got promoted to corporal while I was over there. <coughs> I uh, enlisted when I was 17 uh, in the uh, program that the Army had at that time, the ASTP program. Uh, it was a training program for uh, uh, inductees that uh, got good grades on the uh, uh, Army general classification test score and the idea was that we'd be sent to college for two to three years and then we would uh, all have assignments in the engineers in the linguistics department and uh, probably be stationed in the states or at least in the headquarters area when we're overseas uh, and probably wouldn't get too close to the front line uh, and we also would have a chance to go to uh, um, uh, OCS, the Officer Training School. Well, it seemed like a real great idea until uh, in the winter of 1944, just before the invasion, uh, General Marshall suddenly realized that he was going to be uh, short of replacements to take the place of the casualties, and uh, so they wound up canceling of uh, the ASTP for about 130 uh, students and the uh, and about 70,000 that were in uh, aviation cadet training because the uh, was the uh, Air Corps at that time was part of the Army so there were about 200,000 men they picked up most of which had had their basic training and were and could be assigned to divisions so all of a sudden uh, <laughs> 200,000 of us that had planned on being officers and you'd be sitting at a desk someplace and all of a sudden we're in the infantry and not just in, in, the, in the headquarters section. The only places they needed anybody was either riflemen or ammunition bearers and that's where most of us wound up. So it wasn't unusual to have a, a machine gun squad like I was in with the uh, squad leader, the sergeant, who would maybe just got through eighth grade, and he had three ammunition bearers that were printer graduate engineers or on their way to being graduate engineers. That was a really crazy setup. But uh, that was, I uh, was with the 89th, and uh, we went overseas in, in January, the next January, 45, and we were assigned to the 3rd Army, General Patton's uh, Army and uh, went through Luxembourg and, and it was about at Luxembourg that we, or just past Luxembourg that we uh, went into the front lines and as into combat. Uh, our first big uh, mission, I guess, was crossing the Moselle River and most of the bridges had all been bombed. Either we'd either blown them up with air with the uh, with bombs from from planes or the Germans blew them up on their way back so we couldn't use them. So crossing the river uh, was either in uh, little assault boats or I was driving the Jeep for our squad and uh, so I got to go over in one of the Higgins boats that we carried around to use a lot. Uh, you could back the Jeep and a trailer in and go across and get off the other side. And uh, moving on up through the Rhine River crossing, and uh, when the war was at the end, uh, the 7th of, of May, we were right on the Czechoslovakian border. Uh, there were some troops that got into Czechoslovakia. We didn't, we were, we were stationed right on the line that they had drawn and said, the Americans would go no further than this and the Russians were, so we were 
we were waiting for the Russians to come for three weeks, I guess. And they never did come where we were, just a little further north of us was where they finally had the meeting of the Russians and the... Hmm. Um, what made you interested in enlisting, even at the age of 17, you know, still before when you had to? Uh, partly because that was, it looked like one of the best chances that I'd found to get a college education. Uh, I was, lived on a farm, brought up on a farm, and uh, I always said kind of as a, as a, as a joke, although well, it was really true, my father and grandfather were great men, wonderful men. I, I couldn't ask for anybody better. And they were very hard workers, but they had lousy timing. They went into the dairy business in 1928, just ahead of the Great Depression and spent the next 20 years trying to get out from under. Uh, so things were, were pretty lean through the 30s, but, but most of the farms were in the same situation, so it didn't really seem that bad. Because uh, if everybody's barefooted, you don't think about having shoes. You know? right. so, not that we were barefooted, but... Uh, and <clears throat> uh, I had always thought I'd like to be in the military. And I was thinking this morning, I used to look through the Boys Life magazine and look at the ads for military schools and think, gee, that'd be fun to go to a military school. <laughs> but it never occurred to me what you did beyond being fun. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was, that was part of it. Uh, and there were five of us. This was a rather, rather small high school we went to. And there were five of us in the, uh, what was advanced mathematics at that time, solid geometry, trigonometry. And, uh, uh, and four of us all decided that we would take this uh, AGCT test just for fun. And we all uh, scored quite high on it because we immediately got word that, that uh, they were interested in us. So we all enlisted, three of us in the Army and one in the Navy. He was a smart one. He went in the V-12 program, which wasn't canceled. And he stayed right on at the uh, University of, Car of North Carolina until uh, the war was over. He spent the whole war going to school. So, uh, so he did get his education. Uh, the rest of us didn't. And, um, but the three of us all went, got out alive. Uh, one of them, uh, just by just by chance, was sent to a division that was all ready to go over, and they went. He was over there right shortly after the invasion. Uh, the the 89th that I was sent to was uh, was just in the process of rebuilding, and so it took four, five, six months to rebuild, retrain before we went over. So anyway, uh, this uh, fellow's name was, was Tallman, Dick Tallman, and he played soccer, was a, was a good soccer player, and played defense, and had a heck of a kick. And we picked up the nickname of Boomer, they call him Boomer Tallman. And uh, he was in at the Battle of the Bulge, uh, Got a battlefield commission, a second lieutenant, and uh, happened to be back home uh, when I got out of service and got a chance to see him. And, um, uh, and, and shortly after the war was over, uh, he, he got an appointment to West Point. He'd had that in for a couple of years or more. He was already a second lieutenant, so he had to resign his commission start over as a plug at West Point, and uh, finished that, came out, and unfortunately, uh, he worked his way up to Brigadier General and was killed in Vietnam. So of the four of us, he's the only one that didn't, didn't make it back. Um, in terms of your, your boot camp and training experience, both the academic and the, the actual boot camp experience, you know, what was that like? Is there anything that sticks out in your memory in terms of 
of what you had to go through or, or anything like that? Well, we were uh, the first eight or nine weeks that I was at Fort Benning. And Fort Benning is the biggest uh, infantry training base for the Army. Uh, it's an enormous place. And it's where the uh, uh, airborne troops were training, the paratroopers were training there. Uh, the Rangers were training there. And so we were using some of the same facilities. We weren't doing exactly the same training, but it was basically the same basic training that the paratroopers and the Rangers were, were going through. Uh, and then after I'd been in the, was in the hospital, got out, and, they, and uh, I went to another infantry training camp uh, and, and finished up. But the, uh, the training at Benning was considerably rougher and, and tougher than it, than it was uh, uh, at the next camp that I went to. That was uh, because it was pretty similar, as I say, to the... Uh, in fact, we were out in, in the field uh, whether we were marching or whatever we were doing. And, and pretty near every day we'd see the planes coming in, the paratroopers jumping out, you know, practice jumps and so on. Um, in terms of, of when you arrived in Europe, you said that it was in January of, of 45. Mm -hmm. um, can you 44. Share, 44, I'm sorry. Can you share a little bit about when you first arrived, some of the early experiences, things like that? You're right, it was 45. Okay. Okay. Yeah, January of 45. Uh, you know, the, uh, all of our, practically all of our regiment was on one ship going over about 5,000, which makes a pretty good boatful. Yeah. <laughs> and, they're, uh, and they're crammed in six, six bunks, six high with only about 18 inches between bunks. Um, and uh, the joke was that the, the, the top bunk was the best place to be in case anybody got, <laughs> got seasick. Uh, but, and it was, it was a very rough crossing. January in the North Atlantic is a, I, being a farm boy, I have never seen the ocean before. In fact, never been away from, more than 30 miles away from home till I got on the bus to, <laughs> to leave. Uh, and um, uh, we were quite fascinated with the, but the looks of the ocean, although it was a little bit uh, scary seeing these big waves coming in and so on. We, the, the rumor was that we were going to Southampton, and I guess that was, from what I've read since, that was right. We were going to go to Southampton, and then they were going to do some uh, maneuvers and so on. Well, we got off the coast of uh, British Isles, didn't know it at the time, but uh, there were a lot of subs in the area. And they decided that uh, we'd go right on to La Havre, France, and uh, uh, and get out there. Well, La Havre, all of the coast of France, of course, the the docks had all been bombed and and uh, or blown up. So uh, we had to uh, we had to go in in uh, uh, LCIs, landing craft infantry. Uh, down the side of the ship and and, uh, and into the and we and they for some reason the army always does things like that in the middle of the night it was and it was January and colder in the Dickens and a uh, uh, few guys got wet and then they had to sit there in their wet clothes for the next two hours <laughs> uh, anyway we got in loaded in big trucks tractor trailers with no tops on them just benches along the side. And it was about 30, 40 miles to the camp. The Army had set up camps right around the Harve. And uh, for some reason, they were all, they were called the cigarette camps. One was Lucky Strike, 20 Grand, uh, Philip Morris, uh, and uh, we went to uh, Lucky Strike. And since we weren't supposed to be there, there wasn't, the, the only thing that they had been able to get set up was, was uh, the tents with the top of the tents, no, no side uh, curtains on them, 
and they had about eight inches of snow, so it was about eight inches of snow inside the, the tents. When we got there, oh, probably two o'clock in the morning, something like that. And they had set up a, a, a little mess line right out in the field with, I don't remember whether it was soup or, or uh, uh, beef stew or whatever it was, it was hot anyway. And uh, we could go through the line, and the line was probably a quarter of a mile long, you go through and get a canteen cup full, go back around, get in the end of the line, and that's what we did. Uh, wasn't anything else to do anyway. The next day, we got side curtains on and then got cots. But a, a canvas cot, when there's snow under it, and, uh, and it's maybe 20 to 30 degrees, is, is just as cold on the bottom as it is on the top. And it was, it was quite, quite cold sleeping there for a while. Uh, after we'd been there a week or so, the weather warmed up. All that snow melted and made the darndest mess of mud you ever saw. We spent uh, days and days shoveling gravel. The trucks were hauling gravel in and we'd shovel gravel, trying to make a solid road or a solid place to put anything. And uh, uh, well, you know, that's at least it's fairly safe here anyway. We'd, occasionally there'd be a plane coming over to, uh, looking for something to strafe, but it really wasn't a, a big problem. The first men that got killed in our division, uh, there, was a, there was an airstrip. It wasn't being used right near where we were, and the Germans had mined the airstrip. And the, the guys in the engineering battalion were clearing it, and I think there were either two or three of them that were killed clearing the mines. Hmm. It was the, 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 about the least uh, desirable job in the military, I think, is, yeah. is uh, demining an area. Now, overall, in your um, regiment, in the, the men that you were serving most closely with, um, in the combat that you saw, were there a lot of casualties? Were, I mean, was it kind of limited to, to operations like the mine? Thing? Well, we didn't have the heavy casualties that some of the divisions did. Mm -hmm. Some of the divisions, like the, the first division, the Big Red One, and one of my friends from Big Flats was in that. They were in Africa, and then they went to Italy. And then they came back to England and went in the invasion, and some of the guys who went in the invasion had been all through Africa and Italy. Uh, this, my friend Ike uh, fought with the first up through to the Battle of the Bulge and, uh, and was taken prisoner and was in a POW camp until he got out. So we, we, had, we had a few that were POWs, but by the time uh, that we got into combat, it was a little different than what the, the fellows had seen back on the coast of France. Uh, because we were, uh, we were really beginning to push pretty hard. We had a lot more men, a lot more equipment, uh, and uh, although we had, uh, I, if I remember right, or someplace in the neighborhood of 2,000 in the in the in the division that were casualties. Mm -hmm. uh, in our uh, platoon. Uh, our first casualty was we had uh, two, two medics in our platoon. And uh, the first one was the, was the first one in our uh, company that was killed. That was on the Moselle River crossing. Uh, went out, one of the guys was hit, he went out to try to help him and, and he got killed. Uh, and then um, our uh, ammunition bearer uh, was shot through both feet uh, and he hadn't been with us too long. Uh, he, I'm not even, yeah, I think he went overseas with us, uh, but he wasn't, hadn't been with us in the States for very long. Anyway, uh, I don't know what happened to him because he went back to the medics and probably went on home. I don't know. Uh, the, our first gunner, or the real good friend of mine, uh, 
and rode in the front seat of the Jeep with me when we were traveling, we were moving, uh, was killed. And uh, he's uh, buried in the U.S. Cemetery in uh, Margraten, Holland. And I've been to that cemetery and have a picture. That was another thing I couldn't find this morning was that uh, was a picture of, uh, of, uh, of Joe's cross. And if you've seen pictures of those cemeteries, it's, it's, it's really, anybody that goes to Europe should go to see one of those. There's about 8,500 buried in that one cemetery. And there's uh, six or seven cemeteries in, and of course, that doesn't include all the ones that came back home and were buried back here. Uh, and uh, <coughs> after the, uh, our first medic, Pendleton, George Pendleton, was killed, uh, our, our other medic, usually, we were, I was a, uh, we we're the first squad, so we were the first jeep in the platoon when we were moving. And so, uh, um, we called him Whitey. Uh, almost everybody had a nickname. And he rode with us, usually rode back on the trailer, sat on the trailer. And um, at the time that Joe got killed, uh, Whitey got hit. It wasn't terribly serious. In fact, it was, he got hit in the butt. <laughs> and uh, one of the other fellows and I were, were or, you know, half carrying him, half walking, to get him back out of there. And he said, what am I going to tell my girlfriend when she says, where'd you get shot? <laughs> so we wound up, uh, at that point, uh, there were only two left in the squad, and that was the squad leader and me. Uh, but as it, as it turned out, that was really was, that was April 12th, same day that President Roosevelt died, same day that uh, General Eisenhower uh, went to see the concentration camp at Ordruff, which is right next door, but we were just outside of that. And so anyway, they're just, that's the ones that Chris, we saw. As we were going along, uh, lots of times the armor was in front of us. Uh, we come to a town or come to a uh, an entrenchment or something, and the rifleman would come up. And we'd set up the machine gun, and after the whatever fighting there was was over, there's usually there's dead Germans here and there. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I've been asked if I, how many civilians were killed, and, and I don't know except for the area that we went through. I suspect there were more civilians killed in the uh, bombings, uh, because we, were, we certainly didn't intentionally. Uh, and, and I don't remember any. Uh, what, what was strange when, when I got back home, and my mother and father were uh, very active Grange members. I don't hear much about the Grange anymore, but it was a big, that was where all the social activities were in the, in the, out in the farm country. And I remember going to Grange meeting and talking to people there, told them that uh, uh, we really liked the German people, <clears throat> but we sure didn't have anything good to say about the Russians. And they're saying, this is backwards. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to be friends with the Russians. And we were saying, you just wait a few years and you won't be feeling that way. Uh, but we, the German people were so much like, well, it's no wonder because my grandfather was German. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how they got into the situation they got into, I, nobody knows. It's hard to believe. Yeah. But the, um, as I said, the day before, uh, Joe got killed. No, it's about a week before. The 4th of April, uh, we had been uh, hooked up 
uh, attached to the 4th Armored Division. This was the second or third time that we'd they'd form a combat team with, with part of the 4th Armored. And then our battalion and, and, uh, and the platoon of uh, heavy weapons uh, as a combat team. And apparently, we didn't know where we were going. We couldn't read the road signs anyway. So we just follow the follow whatever's in front of you. Uh, but uh, Patton was really anxious to get to Berlin. Of course, he never did, but that was, he was going to get to Berlin ahead of uh, Montgomery. You know, uh, Bernard Montgomery is head of the British forces general, uh, and. All, this is shortly after we went across the Rhine, and as I say, you know, you never knew what you were doing. They just say, you know, we're moving out, moving out, uh, and we were hooked up again with the Fourth Armor, and we took off in a, in a, in a convoy, really, with the with some of the tanks up front, and the, the uh, one tank would take the lead for a while, and then drop back, and somebody else would, rather than have the you know, the same one up in front all the time. And uh, uh, we were, we went through several, quite a few little towns, uh, eventually got out on the uh, Autobahn. Well, you'd go on the Autobahn and then you'd find it had been blown up, you know, so you'd go out and go around and get back again. And uh, all we knew was that, it was that every time we tried to stop and catch some sleep, you'd just about get to sleep and somebody would say, oh, we're moving out again. In fact, but in, in our platoon, and I, I only remember it in our platoon, uh, when you had to, you know, and I used to have to get the other drivers up, you know, wouldn't give them a boot or something, and we used to say, let's roll. And if you remember on 9-11, the, the plane that, uh, that went down in Pennsylvania, uh, <coughs> Uh, and that was when the, uh, he was talking to his wife, and he said to the other guys, let's roll. And when I heard that, I he got the funniest feeling because that's exactly what we used to chase each other out and we'd say, let's roll. And, uh, we, we finally stopped at, uh, at Gotha. And at that point, we know now we were about 50 miles ahead of the front of the line, the front lines. Uh, we just pulled way out. And that was what we were supposed to be doing, breakthrough, uh, blow up everything in sight and keep moving. But we were running out of gas. Tanks were running low. And so we had to wait for, for more fuel. And uh, uh, where, where we stopped at Gotha, was probably just a, really a few miles from the order of concentration camp. And uh, that same day, some of our uh, battalion that were out on patrol uh, came on this concentration camp. And then some of the 4th Armored came in, and in fact there was a, a big fence and a gate, and, and uh, uh, one of the tank destroyers <coughs> came up and, and just drove right through and flattened the fence. And, and that was uh, what first started uh, people knowing about the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. So by the time, by the time Eisen got, Howard got there, we had kept on, we kept right on going. We were 20, 30 miles further up into Germany by the time he got there. But I've got some pictures of it if you want to see them. Sure, we can, uh, we'll do that later on in the, the interview. So, uh, but I would love to come back to that. And, and, yeah. Uh, now, just about life while you were were in the army, while you were overseas, um, can you talk a little bit about um, everything from how you kept in touch with your family to the food to what you guys did for entertainment? Um, just kind of what you remember about just general life while you were in well, the Well, there were... Uh, Two, two particular things that I have, have remembered and thought about a lot, and it kind of falls in the fun category. Uh, when just about 
a day or two after the seventh of May. I'm not sure just what day. <clears throat> uh, our transportation corporal and I were we've both been in ASTP, so we're good friends. And for some reason, we were up in the uh, uh, the company headquarters. We've been sitting there for several weeks. Then you kind of got settled in. We had a mess tent set up and so on. We were in company headquarters and our company commander was Captain Izzo, Edmund Izzo. And I just learned he lives up in Vermont. I'm going to try and run him down next summer if he's still alive. Uh, and he came in and uh, yeah, we were just, just chatting a little bit and he said, hey, when did you guys have a furlough? And he started laughing he said, you got to be kidding. He said, no, when, when are you? I said, I never had one, neither one of us. We'd had a couple of delay in routes and a three-day pass, but we'd never had a furlough. And this is, what, two years, I guess, since we put in. And he said, well, I just got to notice here that uh, there's a certain number of men from the battalion uh, are, that we can send um, on, a, uh, on a leave. And, uh, and we're supposed to send one officer and two men from, the, from uh, Company M. And he said, I think I'm going to appoint myself to go. He said, you guys want to go? I said, sure, why not? So he said, well, let's not spread the word around too much. So uh, about a day or two later, we just left. And very few of the company clerk knew where we were going. They didn't know what we were up to or where we were going or anything. Well, it turned out we were going to Riviera down to Nice. And we got, took the train down to Nice. And uh, we were there. Uh, Ten days, I think, and um, <laughs> since we, uh, in the <coughs> uh, situation that we had run into when when Joe got killed, uh, what it was was a was a trap. Then there were uh, two Tiger tanks that were that were camouflaged on the edge of the woods, and we did it, we did, I guess, blame the platoon leader, uh, pulled around the corner and stopped and left me sitting right on four corners and you never do that. And Joe jumped up to, to yell at uh, uh, Howard Merrill was driving the, the platoon leader's jeep and he, we called him Peavy. And he stood up and he said, Peavy, get the hell out of here. And just about that time, they opened up and he was shot right through the head, sitting right next to me. But anyway, uh, they, we piled out into the ditch and, uh, uh, and they proceeded to shoot up the Jeeps. And we couldn't, couldn't get the Jeep out of there. Mine would run. Uh, and anyway, we had to get back up into the woods because we had nothing to fight tanks with. We didn't have any, uh, everything was with the riflemen and, and they were uh, quite a ways away. So they came down and they uh, drove one or two of the Jeeps and they hooked onto mine and towed it away because they wanted the gas, wanted the fuel. Mm -hmm. you know? And they knew there were cans on the back of the Jeep and in the trailer. Anyway, we, but also all our clothes were in the trailer. So we had, you know, not, not even a shaving kit. Everything was gone except what we were wearing. Uh, and we managed to get uh, a new suit of what we called ODs, olive drab wool. So we wound up on the Riviera in combat boots with wool pants and wool long sleeve shirts. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, we were there uh, 10 days just a day or two before we were ready to leave, uh, Captain Izzo showed up. And he said, well, I don't know if we're having a good time. And he said, well, he said, I just found out the division is moving. They're going back to the coast. But they're not shipping out. Mm -hmm. So there is, you know, he said, and, and, and we don't, we haven't really been officially notified that they're there. So he said, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. So, a few days went by and he came back up and he said, well, the division's back in Camp Lucky Strike again and they're going to be sitting there a while. So he said, I think we'll, think we'll go up to Holland. 
Well, we got the whole bunch on a train, went to Holland, checked into a rest camp in, in Holland, in Kirkray, Holland. And he said, uh, oh, tomorrow the next day I'll send a message to, to the division that, uh, that we're up here and ask them where we're supposed to go. Well, that took three or four days, so we were in Holland three or four days. And, and then he came down and he said, well, you got word. We're supposed to go back, supposed to go to Paris, and then they'll send trucks up for us. So we went to Paris, and he waited a couple days to let them know we were there. So we spent three, four days in Paris, and finally got back to join up with our uh, company. <laughs> and then these guys say, where in hell have you been? <laughs> and we told them we'd been on the Riviera in <laughs> Paris. But that I certainly remember that that was uh, that was that was a lot of fun. We it was it was kind of worth waiting to get a chance to do that. Um, how did you stay in touch with your family while you were over there? Was there was there any communication back and forth? Or? Uh, yeah. Um, really, it wasn't too much of a problem up until the time we. Uh, the whole division pulled out uh, to head for Luxembourg. And uh, I've got a big shoe box that I found after my mother died, all full of letters that I sent her. And I haven't been through any of them. I haven't really wanted to. Uh, I should, uh, but I haven't. But there's a gap, I think, from uh, about the time we left Camp Lucky Strike until the war was over. Uh, there wasn't much of any place. Well, you could, if we if we if we uh, uh, went back into the reserves for a day or so, uh, we'd get a chance to write a letter and give them to the company clerk, and he'd get them mailed. And then sometimes they'd bring up a sack full of mail, and you know. But uh, for the most part, uh, it uh, uh, we were able to communicate back and forth pretty well. Um, in the field, like you mentioned, arriving and it being 20 degrees and 8 inches of snow, what was the, the food like um, over the, the long haul? <clears throat> well, it wasn't much to brag about. <laughs> in fact, it's, the surprising thing is that they were able to get anything to us. And, uh, and although it's sort of an unwritten rule that nobody ever claims that a meal is any good. Uh, that, that's against the rules. You have to complain about it. <laughs> and, uh, and you hear, uh, even today, you hear uh, the guys that I have coffee with, uh, I say, well, I'm having chipped beef on toast tonight. <laughs> and they said, didn't you get enough of that? I said, you know what, really, it was pretty good. Uh, I didn't complain too much about it. The the rations that we that we had the K rations and the uh, D rations were really emergency. That was nothing but a chocolate bar, so hard you couldn't hardly chew it. K rations weren't too bad, and C rations were like canned hot dogs and beans, canned beef stew. Uh, if you could heat it up, it wasn't too bad. Uh, and I was lucky that. I had the Jeep so we could carry a couple of cases of sea rations in the Jeep or in the trailer. And uh, since it was my trailer, uh, I get most of the hot dogs and beans, which were the best ones. <laughs> and uh, when we start out in the morning, uh, I put a can of hot dogs and beans on the manifold mm -hmm. under the hood. and. Uh, you know, in an hour, I'd have, have a can of hot, hot dogs and beans. And we carried a little, uh, little a gas stove. I'm not sure where we got it, but a little gas stove. We could put a pan of water on it and heat it and make coffee. We usually had coffee uh, to, you know, to carry with us. So we were better off than the rifle one because we had the Jeep to carry things in. When we... Uh, and I don't remember how long, but uh, we'd been up in the line for two or three or four days. Usually they rotate out and rotate back into reserve. 
And uh, if, if we stopped in one place long enough for the uh, kitchen to come up, uh, it's amazing. We'd, uh, we'd get back and they'd have uh, beef stew is what I remember. They'd have beef stew, and, and, uh, but they had pretty, pretty good meals. Uh, I told the, the grandchildren, I, I wrote about, uh, wrote a little thing about what I did over there. And uh, when our ammunition bear, the zoo, got shot through the feet, uh, at that time they were uh, also shooting at the Jeep too, and, and we were trying to get a machine gun set up. Anyway, there's, uh, we knew that it was a sniper because you could tell from from the sound right. what it was. You could you got so you could tell an M1, uh, you could tell a grease gun, that the old uh, machine guns, and you could tell a burp gun because nothing sounded like a burp gun. When, and you could and you could tell uh, the 88 shells when they went over, uh, and they don't sound like they do on television, and bullets don't sound like they do on television. You, know, you hear man, what trying to make it sound good, you know. But they snap. If you hear a snap, just like a broken twig, you know there's one pretty close to your ear. Uh, anyway, in, in the Jeep, uh, and I've got a, uh, I can find a picture here. Yeah, there we are right there. The Jeep I drove was just like that. That's one, I took that over in Holland. Uh, people in, uh, in Holland, in, in France, uh, have gotten these old army vehicles and restored them, fixed them all up, and they put them in parades and things. Mm -hmm. can, we, can we set that aside so that we oh, can get sure. a, a close up later sure. on? This, this windshield folds down. Mm -hmm. See how the little arm comes down there? You unhook two latches here, the windshield folds down flat against here. Mm -hmm. And then there's a canvas cover goes over it. And, and that made a dandy place to hide things or <laughs> stick things. And I used to carry my mess kit in there. They just stuff the mess kit in and if we ever got a place where we were going to get a hot meal, I had the mess kit. Yeah. And uh, it was several days after uh, the zoo had got shot and we got to go back, they had a mess line set up. I went and got my mess kit out and it had a hole in it. <laughs> so went back and looked, sure enough, there was a hole through the canvas too. <laughs> Put a hole right through my mess kit. Uh, and kids thought that was kind of funny. There's uh, one of the, uh, one of our 89, that's at Margrotten Cemetery. Now, I know just from talking in the, the preliminary interview, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your uh, Christmas tree cutting adventures uh, while, you were, while you were in Europe. Yeah, that was... Um, after we'd had this great escapade of going through uh, the Riviera, then it was back to work. And... Uh, <clears throat> I'd been driving the Jeep, but I had uh, a license. And believe it or not, the Army made you have a license before you could drive anything. Uh, an Army license, of course. I had an Army license. I could drive up to two and a half ton trucks. And uh, so, and at first I was, I knew the guys in the motor pool and so on. So I uh, started driving a, a, a two and a half ton truck. And I, I had a picture, that's the one that I was driving. And uh, we uh, were hauling people, or, or people, uh, troops that were going through on their way home. Mm -hmm and they'd give them a 24-hour pass to Paris. And we'd haul them in, in the trucks, 
And uh, then after 24 hours, we'd roll them all in the back of the truck and haul them back. And I said, I don't think their mothers would have been happy <laughs> if some of them were in. Uh, but after that, uh, we uh, uh, were separated from the 89th. The 89th was going, originally, was going back to be re-outfitted and go to Japan. And that's what they were getting set up to do. I had enough points so that I wouldn't be, wouldn't be going back, which was, uh, this is a good deal, you know. I was at least a bit crazy about touring Japan or Okinawa or any of those places. And uh, uh, so those of us that, that had enough points not to go were going to be in the Army of Occupation. Well, they never told us. We just turned out that way. Uh, but we, uh, uh, one day, uh, got ready to, to ship out. Uh, in, in 40 and 8 cars. You heard of 40 and 8 cars? Mm -hmm. Well, they're French. They were, they were famous from World War uh, World War I. Uh, they, they, it says 40 homies and 8 chevaux. It means 40 men or 8 horses. And uh, I know I've got a picture out there. It's right there. Uh, that's what we rode in. <laughs> that doesn't show much of it, but they were the most primitive things. No, no springs or anything. Just bump, bump, bump. Anyway, here's, here's all these 48 cars. Half a dozen bales of straw on each one. And so we climbed aboard. And it took us. I think three days or more to, to get to get to Austria, which is where we were going, because they'd pull off to the side and, and let us through trains through. Mm -hmm. Then we'd pull back out and away we'd go again, eating sea rations. And um, I said, that's where I learned to play bridge on a bale of straw. Uh, the guy was, one of the fellows was teaching us all how to play bridge and right? sitting around with a deck of cards. <coughs> but that. Uh, took us up to um, St. Florian, <clears throat> the monastery in Austria, in St. Florian. And uh, our uh, platoon just happened to get assigned to guard the monastery. And we were there three, four months, I guess. Uh, we're very many people in town. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, pulled guard duty. I had was back driving my Jeep then. In fact, I, it, it, while we were there, I was with the 83rd Division, and, uh, and I got my corporal stripes and was acting as motor pool sergeant and was expected to get my third stripe as a sergeant most any time. Uh, when I suddenly got shipped to Vienna. I don't know why, but went to Vienna. But in, uh, it was in St. Florian that we, uh, uh, met uh, Peter. Peter, F-U-C-H-S. Peter and his uh, uh, sister, Kathy, and his mother. And there's a, there's a, there's a letter that his mother sent back to, to my mother. Uh, and uh, we, this little Carl was a, a sharp little guy. He's 10 maybe, I guess, someplace around 10. Uh, and uh, <coughs> he was always coming over, hanging around with my friend Jake and I, and, and uh, we go to the monastery. He and the, they were living there in a little apartment. They were refugees from Yugoslavia. And the same, it, it's funny, that if you go back a couple of years, 
when we were having the Bosnia Serbian is exactly the same thing. Only they were monarchists. They were loyal to King Peter, and and they they uh, conscripted his father and brothers, and so they 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 got out of the country and got over into Austria, uh, and uh, just they're displaced people really. But Carl had learned some English and he wanted to improve his English, and he'd come up and as I said in the letter, we taught him to play blackjack. And, Trying to play poker, <laughs> not for money, but just for fun, and uh, uh, and of course we always giving him stuff. He's taking him through the chow line in the, in the mess hall, and uh, I guess I don't have. Anyway, along where where uh, uh, wherever GIs went, they were always picking up. Kids or dogs or both, and we had Carl. We also had a nice little dog, <laughs> Jake and I had. It. We kept there. He used to ride around the jeep with us, and uh, and, and Carl did. And uh, uh, as I say, as it came up to, to Christmas time, and, and one day uh, uh, we said something about it. Did they celebrate Christmas? And he said, Oh yeah, we're Christians and we celebrate Christmas, but we aren't going to have a Christmas tree this year because. Uh, well, there just weren't any. I don't even know you could buy one anyway. And uh, but there was an estate just out of out of the villas there a little ways with not not a plantation, but just all kinds of trees, a lot of little mm -hmm. pine trees. And uh, we said, well, we'll go up there and cut one. And he said, we're not allowed to go up there. And we said, well, maybe you aren't allowed, but <laughs> they're not going to tell us they're not allowed. So Jake and I went up and we cut a tree for Carl and we cut one for the mess hall, brought him back down. And uh, then we went to church Christmas Eve. Jake was Catholic. So we went to, to church where these two big uh, spires are is the church is right under there. It's just an enormous place. There were about 20 monks there in that whole darn place. I, I guess it's still there today. I'd like to see it again. I mean, it's really impressive when you come up the road. Yeah. Big thing. And they were, uh, there were, at that time, at the end of the war, there were still a lot of, particularly SS troops, that were the, the worst of the bunch. And they just disappeared. Uh, got rid of their uniforms, put on, old clothes, and uh, there were, and I haven't, I've never seen any pictures, and I, sh I sure wish that I had, because I lost my camera when they, with the Jeep. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of good film, I think. But uh, in the last of April, 1st of May, the main roads leading out of Czechoslovakia, Poland, were just a solid stream of DPs, displaced persons. Uh, we, we'd watch them go by all day, maybe half the night. Uh, then they just go over in the field and lay down, go to sleep, and get up. They didn't know where they were going. As they got back into our rear area, they were trying to round them up into camps and feed them. And, uh, and that was a real problem, too, because what are you going to do with them afterwards? Uh, but. Uh, uh, that was basically what Carl and, and his family were, were displaced persons. And, and they found that the, some of the SS troopers would get into old clothes and then mix in with the, with the DPs to get on back and get back into Germany someplace. And I'm sure a lot of them did. Uh, we used to sit there and watch them and, and, and to see if we could pick any of them out. And that's what we were doing up there, was patrolling the roads. Uh, and we were afraid that some of these guys might be like the, uh, the uh, bombers in, in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, who knows, they might, we didn't know whether they would. I don't think there's much of that happened. They just disappeared. Of course, they hunted down some of the ones they really wanted. Right. 
and we never had any trouble up there, uh, fortunately. Mm -hmm. But that was that was. I've had some. I had kind of had some fun. You just kind of mentioned, you know. Well, I remember the Christmas I spent in the monastery. You know. Uh, and, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to show you. Oh, there's, there's, uh, there's Carl's sister, Kathy, and there's, uh, there's the Christmas tree we were cutting down. That's us out there, and that's a picture of Carl that his mother sent us after he had grown up. And uh, we don't know just where he went to after that. We didn't, kind of lost touch with him. After that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a short break here, and we'll switch the tapes, and then we'll okay keep going. So. Well, I'm having fun if you are. Two of the interview taking place with Mr. Gummo on Monday, December sixteenth, two thousand and two, here at the Shimon County Historical Society. My name is Jason Harmon, um, and Mr. Gummo, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit to the time. Uh, as your service was coming to a close, your last days, uh, is there anything that you can recall about um, how you were feeling or just the process of, of your service coming to an end? Yeah, you, sure. I, I just threw me a little bit when you said you wanted to talk about my last days. <laughs> you know? I apologize. <laughs> well, uh, I spent the last three months, I guess, uh, time I was in Europe in Vienna and it's I found most people I don't know why they'd be aware of it but they're not that uh, along with Berlin Vienna was a four power city it was in the Russian zone it was split into four sections there was a French zone uh, English Russian and American zone and uh, and once you got out of the American zone you were in 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 Russia or in the Russian area of of, uh, of Austria, so you really couldn't go too far. And uh, and for going back and forth, uh, they either did it in convoys or or on the train. Uh, but you know, having a chance to be in Vienna was was really nice. And there we had uh, we had taken over a restaurant, what had been a restaurant bar, sort of a nightclub, really as our mess hall, and we had uh, Viennese cooks and Viennese girls to wait on the table, and, and uh, on Friday nights they had a Viennese band. Uh, I think it had an accordion and a bass, maybe a saxophone or something, but since Vienna was the, was the home of, of Strauss and the Strauss waltzes, they played everything to the same beat. <laughs> no matter what American song it was, it was it was all of the oom pa pa, but that was all, that was all right. Uh, and uh, and I was in Vienna when I got uh, my, finally got enough. You were awarded points for uh, being in combat, length of time over there, and different things. Mm -hmm. Got enough points, you get get shipped home. So I shipped home from Bremerhaven. Uh, and uh, in to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and then was discharged from, from Fort Dix to go home. Uh, and uh, one of the things I had said that uh, uh, when I get home, one of the first things that I want to do is is uh, get myself a motorcycle. Uh, so I'd had a chance to ride motorcycles a little bit. So sure enough, that was one of the first things I did. <laughs> I was getting myself a Harley Davidson. And uh, I had a lot of fun with that. Anyway, that I uh, applied, because uh, we had the GI Bill that you're probably familiar with. Uh, I applied to Cornell and applied to Penn State. I wanted to take ag engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, and hadn't heard from either one of them. And it was getting close to close to time to, to go to school, mm -hmm. and one of our 
next door neighbor's uh, sons called me and, and uh, he said, I'm, I'm looking for a ride to go to Alfred. I said, where's Alfred? He said, well, I've got a, an interview up there. He told me about it. And I said, well, I'll go up. Let's go up. He, he had an interview with the head of the Ag Engineering Department, who was a good friend of his father's. And that's the way things happen yeah. sometimes. We were up there on a Saturday, and we got a tour of the Ag Engineering Building and, and all around the campus and so on. And uh, uh, I think the man's name was Mr. Hinkle. And he said, uh, I've got two openings left. I've been holding that uh, for Bob to come up and see if he wanted to go. But he said, uh, said you know, being a, a GI, he said, you'd be at the front of the list. So he said, if you want to go, tell me and, and we'll put you down. So I said, well, this looks good to me. So, so I signed up for Ag Engineering and started that fall. Uh, I was there two years at the Ag Tech School. and. Uh, Met my wife there, and uh, we, I, the, the second year I was there, I sold the motorcycle, and I told my kids, uh, I sold the motorcycle because I couldn't afford a motorcycle and a girlfriend both. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after, after college, was there? Yeah. Um, I took, took two years of ag engineering and got a job with International Harvester uh, that was, to, to me, was the greatest agricultural company. There was the best machinery, and I, this is really great to get a job with them. And I was with them a year, just about a year, and became quite disillusioned with the way the, the, way the company was being run. Even I was an assistant zone manager, but I was, could see enough of what was going on to, to think it wasn't, wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in the service area anyway, mm -hmm. and they had me selling refrigerators and freezers, which wasn't what I trained to do at all. And uh, I, guess it was, I guess I was right because two years before I would have retired, they went out of business, Not completely out, sold out what was left to case equipment and so on. Uh, anyway, it, it, we were living in Ohio and we just decided that was enough. So uh, I, I quit, resigned, and, and uh, uh, we took off and went to California. We were out in California a year and a half. And um, I had worked for a short time before I went to college for uh, a new organization that was, that was just getting started in Pennsylvania. It was a dairy cattle artificial breeding cooperative. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went out to California, I wanted to look into that. I did talk to several people, went out and rode with them, the and even at that point, uh, they were way behind what Pennsylvania had been. And I could see it was going to be quite a while before as much of anything was going to happen in California. And uh, so I wrote to Cornell and got a letter right back saying that they were expanding and hiring. And if I came back, to, told me who to get in touch with. So we said, well, heck with this. We packed up and came on back. And uh, I, went, I went out to Cornell right away and, and uh, hardly missed a day's work for 37 years. Now, Working up at Cornell, what, what capacity were you serving in? Well, I was, uh, the last 25 years, I was living in Big Flats mm -hmm. uh, as an area manager. Okay. We, we had, in, the, in our area, which at that time was uh, New York, all of New England, uh, about half of Pennsylvania, and uh, in, a, in a division in California. Mm -hmm. I had very little, but about 25 to 28 men working for me, all scattered through the southern tier, northern tier of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and, and they were actually doing the inseminating uh, or delivering semen to farmers. Uh, today, most of the big farmers have a herdsman right on the place that actually does the breeding. We deliver the, or our co-op 
delivers the semen to them. Uh, it's quite technical hmm. these days. Uh, and uh, so well, my job was hiring, training, firing if necessary, and public relations. Mm -hmm. Spent quite a bit of time on that, uh, working with dairy farm groups, mm -hmm. uh, putting on some programs uh, and mm -hmm. goodwill things. Right. Um, over the course of, of your years after the service, did you or have you joined any kind of veteran organizations um, specific to your regiment or, um, you know, like a... Yeah, this, this, is, this is the main one. This is the 89th, 89th Division Society. Okay. And that's wherever, wherever there's 89th Division. Uh, <laughs> they just had a, their uh, summer uh, national get-together in Indianapolis. Okay. And I probably would have gone, but it was the 25th and 26th, and I was due to go in the hospital the 27th for a knee replacement. So that was the end of that. Uh, and I belonged to the VFW and the American Legion. Never been particularly active. I hadn't had any mm -hmm. desire to be a post commander or anything like that. Right. Uh, um, from the time that you, that you served, in the military, overseas, through all of your boot camp experience. Is there anything in all of your experience uh, that's, that reshaped something, a way that you thought, or that's influenced you even to this day, um, years down the road from, from those experiences? Yes, I, I think so. Uh, if you've, I don't know whether you've read any of Tom Brokaw's books, he's written two books about the greatest generation mm -hmm. That was the first and the second was The Greatest Generation Speaks. And it was really a collection of, of stories doing just exactly what, what, what you and I are doing here about different ones. Um, I think, and I've, I've known a lot of, of veterans. Uh, in fact, the coffee group I have that I meet with at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there were, there were five of us that were veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was in submarines. One of them was a, uh, a bombardier on a B-24 at 30-some missions. Uh, one of them was, uh, two of them were in the Navy. One of them, well, one of them was in submarines. One of them was in the Seabees, building landing strips and docks in the South Pacific. So, you know, pretty well covers right. the whole area. One of them uh, didn't get in World War II, but he put in 20 years. Uh, in uh, as a mechanic and, and, and eventually a first sergeant uh, in the supply area. Mm -hmm. So it pretty well covered it, but uh, as, as I look at that group and, and at the people I know, most veterans, I think, learn to be quite self-sufficient. Uh, they rarely complain because uh, something didn't happen just the way they thought it should. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think for the most part they have uh, little patience with uh, either with the government or, or with the companies they work for that were, that were putting effort or money into something that was trivial. They, they don't, don't, don't uh, have any patience with trivialities really. And on a lot of them, uh, in fact, the biggest share of them uh, were that were 18 to 25 were depression area children brought up, and, and when we uh, quite often get to talking about that, <laughs> even to the point where I can remember some of us sitting around, each one trying to outdo the other one and telling how poor we were, you know. Well, my father was so poor, you know, but as a, in a you know, not complaining about it, uh, but they learned to do, learn to do, and and I think over the years, uh, employers would lean a little bit towards hiring a World War II veteran because they had a little more maturity. Uh, it's hard now to look back or to look at 
17 and 18 year olds like my grandson who's a great kid and I think I was only a year older than him when I enlisted and I said I couldn't have been that it's, you know but I think I had more maturity uh, grew up on the farm uh, and uh, there were things that had to be done uh, so I and I think that it uh, was a great three years uh, both for the experience of seeing different things, but also as it matures you in a hurry. Uh, either it either matures you in a hurry or, or, or you're washed out. And that happened. There were a lot of guys washed out in basic training, which is what it is in the Army. That just, I remember, the only one I can think of offhand was a uh, fellow that uh, was about two thirds of his way through law school. Why they ever drafted him, I don't know. He had a wife, two kids, I think. All he'd been doing for about three years is sitting in a classroom, and he was in terrible physical shame. At, we, on, uh, on marches, we'd take turns carrying his rifle or take turns carrying his back, and finally one day the first sergeant, I don't know what he was doing out there because he never walked much, but uh, we were carrying his pack, half carrying him, and we said, you know, Sergeant, he got to do something about this. He's never going to make it. And uh, of course, he yelled at us, you know, may I carry his own pack? You know, said, well, if he does, he'll be, you'll have to pick him up because he'll be in the middle of the road. Uh, he soon shipped out, and I think he got discharged. So there were, you know, some that was a big mistake. Uh, and basic training was tough enough so that. Those that made it were tough enough to do what they had to do. Uh, I think it toughened us all up and made us uh, able to take whatever came along as we, you know, and if you're in the working world, you're gonna, some days are going to be pretty good, some aren't going to be too good. Well, that's pretty much all that, that I have. Is there anything else that you'd like to to add on anything that we didn't touch on or anything like that that you'd like to? I'll probably think of half a dozen things <laughs> on the way home. Uh, the, uh, uh, I guess the thing that I, that I really enjoyed the, the most uh, was being able to drive vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd driven trucks from the time I was probably 10 or 11 years old. In fact, I used to, it was when I was 10 that I learned to start our tractor. And I could go start the tractor by putting the crank up on top and then I could get up and jump on it to start the tractor and go out and drag or, you know, whatever we had right. to do. And I drove the truck on the farm. Uh, <coughs> we used it for everything and I drove it a good share of the time. So. Uh, when, when I got to the 89th Division uh, and somebody had to drive in our squad and nobody had the, the experience that I'd had. In fact, there were, there, were, there were any number of guys in our platoon that came from the city and never did not drive. They'd never driven anything. 18 years old, just, you know, <laughs> they just weren't any good at, at something like that. Or, most of the drivers were farm boys or close to it. They're the ones that, that wound up driving the trucks and the tanks mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'd love to do is to, to take some time and spread out some of the, the items that you brought and, uh, okay. and you narrate. So we'll go ahead and we'll move into that part. And... Okay, this is two pictures of us. Uh, the monastery and a couple other pictures of this big monastery in St. Florian, Austria. And our platoon was there from October to January to guard the monastery to make sure that, uh, that it wasn't damaged by any SS troops or anybody else wandering around. Uh, nothing happened while we were there. Uh, there were very few monks there. Uh, there's a big church. The only thing we really found out was they made excellent wine, and we had a deal with the with the 
uh, with the brothers that uh, they'd provide us with a certain amount of wine if we didn't go down and take any ourselves. <laughs> so that's what we did. Uh, we had a good relationship with them. This is a GMC two and a half ton six by six truck that I drove uh, in the uh, summer of 45 uh, when we were in Camp Philip Morris uh, right after the war was over with. And we hauled troops and that, mostly troops, from one place to the other. Uh, this is a picture of me later when I was in Austria for several months from uh, February till May when I was, was discharged. This is a, <clears throat> was sent by the Holocaust Memorial Council to uh, all of the 89th Division infantrymen that, that were still alive that they uh, knew of. The reason was that uh, in April, early April of 1945, uh, our battalion, happened to be the ones that stumbled on the order of concentration camp. And at that time, that was the first, the first, uh, first American troops to get into one of the uh, major concentration camps. And this was at Ordruf, but Ordruf was part of Buchwald, Buchenwald. Uh, so, and that was, was big. There were, I figure, they usually had about 8,000 uh, inmates at, at Ordruf. Uh, there weren't that many when, when the 89th Division got there because they had tried to get them all out of there as much as they could. This is my battalion history, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, we're um, really fascinated with what's politically correct today, and you have to be very careful how you speak about any minorities, and, and rightly so. I, I don't have any disagreement with that. But uh, 50 or 60 years ago, uh, it was perfectly natural. In fact, the newspapers would have such things as how many, how many Japs had been killed or, or uh, so on. And the, the, and the Germans uh, were called Krauts, uh, along with a few other Names. Okay. There was, now this would kind of startle people today. This was the motto of the, of the battalion. Hmm. And this, I just ran down through here a while ago of our company. The names that are in our company uh, uh, from time we went overseas, replacements and so on. And look at the interesting, interesting names. There's Earl Locomoto, uh, Rosalini, Steiger was German, Christophides <laughs> was Greek, Berkowitz, Rooksnitis, Lem Su, uh, was, I guess he was Chinese, Cervantes, and of course we got a Smith in there, and, and then O'Toole and O'Brien and Joe Orsini was uh, uh, Italian. So what he, just about everything you can think of. Uh, Irish, uh, uh, this is our, the division monument in Colorado Springs. Uh, this was put up in, the, in 1980 someplace, I think. This is where the division was activated. They were a mountain division to start with. Uh, this is the uh, the ribbons and the and the campaigns. Uh, this is a uh, Europe, Asia, Middle East campaign. Uh, actually, there's the the campaign ribbon, and then two stars means three different three different battles. So actually, there's three battle circle. One is the is the ribbon. These are the patches of the divisions. This was the ASTP patch when I first went in. This is the one that I'm probably the proudest of of any of them, is the combat infantry badge. And 
you won't see very many. This, just this bar with the rifle, is expert infantrymen, and you occasionally will see them today. Uh, and anybody that's got them knows what it is with a wreath around it. You, you only get that if you were in combat for uh, 30 days. And there's, there's some, some funny cartoons about the guys that are in the rear echelon are just far enough back or in, in a group, in a because uh, it was given by the uh, battalion, regiment, uh, and, and, you, and you see, see guys back in the, uh, <laughs> in the headquarters area wearing them. Anyway, that's, what, that's my corporal stripes. This is our governor, George Pataki, engineered uh, awarding these to, to combat veterans. And this isn't the Jeep that I drove, but it is one exactly like it. And there you can see it with the windshield folded down, and that was the way that we, that we usually had them. It also doesn't have the, uh, a wire bar on it. We, most of them, in fact, the ones that were up in the, up in the front lines had a bar. We welded a piece of angle iron from here right up like this, and then at the top, there's a notch cut in it and sharpened so that if you, if, if you hit a trip wire, or if you came to a trip wire, and, and they'd have them set up just high enough so they'd miss this windshield and catch you under the chin, that it, that would cut the, that was the purpose yeah. for it. And uh, this, is, this is just a map that was in uh, General Patton's uh, memoirs, uh, and I mark the concentration camps that were right here in a row. And they were, all of those were discovered because it, this was the front lines right down through here. They were all discovered within just three, four days of each other. Ordruff was the first one because we happened to be out in front, and Buchenwald was there, Nordhausen. The, the British uh, were at Bergen-Belsen, and Dachau was down there. Interestingly, this is Mothausen, and I, right by Linz, and I was stationed in Linz for a while after the war was over. Hmm. This is a American cemetery in Margraten. There's about 8,000, 8,500 uh, graves there, all of them marked with a cross with their name. This is one of the 89th Division. And there's one, this isn't a picture of it, but there's one there for our uh, first gunner that was killed, Joe Orsini. And uh, I did get to the cemetery with 8,000 crosses that take you a long time to go around. And it happened to get there on a Saturday and there wasn't anybody there to, they've got a register where you can look, see where it is, there wasn't anybody there. So I couldn't look up Joe's, but I did find this one, took a picture of yeah. Joe's would be just the same thing as that. I do have a picture of it now, it's a black and white. Yeah. I guess that's about all of my goodies, <laughs> except for my Luger, which I didn't bring down. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Goma, for your time and for the interview. And uh, Well, I hope this was fun.